the home. Uh, so we're talking about the home at large. In this case, we're talking about Earth, which is to date our only home. So I think it's easier to understand what we mean by the next economy and lift economy by contrasting it with the business, business as usual economy. And the business as, uh, business as usual economy is what we see kind of manifest around us. And it has some norms. And some of the norms that you might be familiar with uh, include uh, the idea of um, concentration of wealth. They're collecting wealth as the means, as the pathway to security. If you have wealth it measured in your ability to have assets and then resources or dollars or currency in order to meet your needs, that's a very normal strategy of the business. And the other norms that you might see would be the idea of competition, uh, of competing with each other uh, to, you know, outdo the other, and again, as a pathway to meet our needs for security. Um, as a consumer in the business as usual economy, you know, you might recognize some of your strategies that if you can accumulate enough wealth to secure your needs, then you can take care of yourself and your family. And so there's this uh, sense of uh, questioning, is there enough for everybody? Well, I better get mine, that type of thing. The business as usual economy uh, has certain outcomes that we could have, so that are pretty easy to correlate with the way in which humanity meets its needs today. And those outcomes are fairly terrific. And I'll name a couple of them, but I'm sure some of you probably know a number of other examples. Uh, but, you know, there's going to be 800 million people who will be hungry tomorrow. There's 800 million people who are hungry today on, on Earth, uh, malnourished, undernourished. There's, of course, since the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005, prior to the IPCC, the largest body of science, scientists the world ever put together, uh, the UN determined that every major ecosystem is in rapid decline on Earth. Um, so in terms of how the environment is doing and how people are doing, we can just take some very simple temperature check uh, and know that things aren't working that well, both for people and for the planet. But the business as usual economy in some ways with its norms is, if you will, working towards its design. You have, you know, four white men who have the equivalent wealth to half of the world's people. That's a fairly enormous and equitable situation, which is really actually hard to grasp. If I really sit with that, it's hard for me to wake up in the morning. Uh, just to the structural inequities that are kind of built into the business as usual economy are not really working for humanity or for the planet. And so something has to come after it. There has to be another way to do this. And what I posited at the beginning is that lift economy, we see that the next economy is actually here. It's just very diffuse and distributed. And so a lot of the work that we do at lift economy is to find examples of what's working and help design it so that it's more whole and then regionally replicable and adaptable so that those models that exist can actually exist many times over and they if you have many times over these models existing, then you could actually transform what's normal. If we could transform what's normal, maybe we can make it so that it works. I'm going to pause and see uh, if Aaron or Sean have any clarification, or Andrew have any clarifications, and see what's coming up in the chat. Well, there's a good question coming up um, in the chat uh, around, is Lyft Economy working with Bali? Um, how many people are familiar with the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies? Anyone? Okay, so um, that, you know, I, I look at this, we really look at this work as um, an ecosystem approach, right? And, and that's why we try and keep our, our programs like this collaborative and, and interactive. It's just one kind um, you know, of uh, fiber in the larger mycelial web of people that are envisioning an economy that works for the benefit of all life, that are actively in solutions. Um, I have personal experience working at, at Bali actually for uh, a little under a year. Um, and the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, which was founded by Judy Wicks, um, is a really great resource for these kind of hubs of um, promoting local uh, production, local consumption, local investment 
um, and that they exist all around uh, the country. Um, and they also have a fellowship program. And, and so certainly that, that is a, a network that we lean on and collaborate with um, on occasion. Um, I would, I guess the, the differentiation is that uh, Lift Economy, we're um, a uh, consulting, an impact consulting group. So we work directly with entrepreneurs. So we kind of roll up our sleeves and oftentimes what we see with entrepreneurs that are working in this next economy is um, there are so many disincentives in our current economy to do right by people on planet. So the impetus for us to really support one another and help one another in prioritizing our values and prioritizing valuing ecosystems and people over profit, it really takes that network of support. And so that's really where Lift Economy as consultants, we come in, um, we, we have a lot of different strategies that we use as consultants, values-based invoicing is one, um, but really it's rolling up our sleeves and walking beside entrepreneurs as they're pioneering these innovative solutions because we know we can't uh, we can't just have, there's not a one size fits all solution, right? We need, just like we need in our gardens, we need a polyculture approach to uh, different strategies for creating the next economy. So how many of you have your own business? Uh, a number of you. How many of you are thinking maybe someday you might want to start your own enterprise or organization? Okay, that's the other half. Uh, and maybe checking on the, the Zoom too, Sean, you could do a quick little poll. Uh, how many of you are maybe looking for a new job or vocation? How many of you are looking to align your investment resources with the next economy? Great, number of us. Great. All of those are kind of some of the roles that uh, we can play, um, including and non-trivial is our role as a consumer. Uh, when we are meeting our own needs for food or comfort or shelter or whatever our needs are, uh, we can also seek out the way to transact and meet those needs in ways that are incongruent with the norms of the business as usual economy. It does take a little bit of extra effort now, but collectively we try and make it easier while working together. There are some principles that uh, we use uh, when we help organizations or individuals design organizations to be in alignment with this emergent next economy. And I'm going to share those right now. And we can share with you as a resource for those uh, both online who are here as a checklist. And you could use this checklist essentially as you look at your organization and say, uh, are these, how, do they, how, does, how does your organization that you're designing, some of you are going to start one, some of you already have to start your own, your own enterprise. How does your enterprise line up with these? Um, so this is uh, both a way to assess um, the wholeness of your organization, and it's also a way if you're just starting something to start designing it. And I'll go through them in brief. Um, each of them uh, can be, you know, take uh, weeks to, to really um, explore in fullness. Uh, what, they, what they mean, but we'll start with just a basic understanding. And Sean, jump in if questions are coming up that are really potent online, if you're watching the chat. I, I will, and um, just a request for Aaron. Aaron, when you're speaking, if you could be in the video, we'd love to see you. Great. Thanks, Sean. And Sean, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Zoom, and I'm going to share my screen. I forgot neglected to do that, so that's for the moment, everybody can see the same uh, design principles. So, uh, oh, and is that possible to see, Sean, or are you seeing Aaron's screen on Zoom? Okay. All right. Need oriented. Uh, this might be self evident, but the there's, when we look at the economy taking care of our home, the most basic things first, food, water, shelter, textiles for comfort, are, are maybe our needs for uh, electricity if it's necessary. Um, but those are the, the things that we need first, right? And uh, 
next economy enterprises kind of start looking at what's most needed, uh, what's most known as needed in my community. And I'm going to make that distinction a couple times, the difference between needs and known needs. Needs and known needs. And it's one of the major pitfalls we find from passionate individuals who want to bring themselves in service to life through economic endeavors, through creating an enterprise, through finding a job, is stumbling across this differentiation between what's needed and what's known to be needed. And it's going to be a point of tension that I'm going to describe. Second one is diverse and inclusive ownership. We find that uh, next economy enterprises take into account the value of diversity. Not only diversity in terms of cognitive friction, the new ideas, new possibilities, uh, but also including more people. There are, of course, by gender and by race, uh, it could be self-evident to all of us here, we can discuss it if need be, that there are structural and institutional inequities that have been created through structural racism, structural sexism, and other forms of categorical exclusion that uh, can be redressed by creating an economy that works for everyone with no one left out. And so when we design an organization, we can either think of including a more diversity of people in the ownership of an organization as an afterthought, or we can do it as a basic principle of how we structure an organization. Any, any questions coming up from either the on life or the online group? Okay. I'm going to keep going. Sean, you go ahead, or Sean or Andrew, jump in if there's something that comes up. Will do. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, also, uh, this idea of equitable or democratic culture. And so, uh, how many of you grew up in a household where, you know, you, you and your family got together and decided what to do together collectively? Probably you. How many of you went to school and as you were raised in school, say elementary school, that kind of level, uh, you got together with your classmates and decided what the curriculum was going to be? Not one person. So, uh, the, uh, I would posit to you that in our experience, most people do not have a lot of experience in how to make collective decisions with other people. Uh, and because we don't have a lot of experience, we find the very premise challenging. And so we default to highly corruptible systems for making collective decisions together, like voting in majority voting elections for representational democracy. In its Maybe that's the best case. Uh, there's a whole sliding scale of other ways to make collective decisions, uh, which, you know, none of them tend to work out well for everybody. And you can look at the world and its state and kind of find that that's, uh, again, probably self-evident. And so the next economy can redress this situation by voluntarily structuring our organizations that we use to create goods and services for each other as equitable and democratic, so that we actually engage our collective decision-making muscles. So those structures, there's lots of different ways to structure an equitable and democratic culture in an organization, and we can talk about some of those and give you some examples in a moment. And yeah, in a moment I'll get to some examples so we can ground these big ideas. Uh, support of local economy ecosystem. As a, as a principle, the next economy that we see emerging is not one of uh, global exploitation. How many of you are wearing shoes today? Uh, how many of you know the person who made your shoes? None of us, right? And not that we have to know the person. How many know the town where the person who made your shoes lives? Nobody knows, right? Do you know that the person who made your shoes was treated fairly or equitably? We don't really know. There's not a lot of transparency in the global consumer-dependent business-as-usual economy that especially that the affluent world kind of takes part in, is complicit in. So a locally self-reliant economy, one where the point of production of a good and the point of consumption of a good are drawn very close to each other, where there's some primary production. 
some people growing their own food, some people making their own shoes. But not everybody meeting all of their needs, obviously. You know, being voluntarily interdependent on a local ecosystem of goods and service providers. Again, it's something that we can orient and design our organization. So this is a checklist. If you're thinking about your organization that you started or one that you are starting, are you voluntarily looking at that local ecosystem? That's where the Bali kind of network kind of comes in as an example. Another uh, example, um, and I'll, maybe I'll go a little bit quicker so we can get to the actual examples of organizations who are doing this. Uh, education embedded into the good or service. I encourage you if you're starting an enterprise right now to think heavily about concepts that come from the business as usual economy, concepts like intellectual property, uh, things that reinforce concepts of scarcity rather than intellectual contribution. Uh, in education embedded into the good or service, could you make it so that if you're providing a good that you actually make it so that your good and the provision of your good makes it so that people know how to meet their own need themselves, so that your business dies over time? Uh, so that organizations actually dissolve. Imagine designing your business so that it dies. Um, that transforms at the very least. And that's something that we see in terms of the wholeness when we see next economy organizations, they're actually doing that. So if you were starting a company that was providing... I have an example. How many of you have um, ever purchased sauerkraut at the store? How many of you have ever made sauerkraut at home? Pretty... Pretty straightforward, right? Sorry, but, um, um, so there's a company, Three Stone Hearts in Berkeley, that actually includes on their label of the, the mason jars that they fill with sauerkraut that's, that's made at Three Stone Hearts. They include all the ingredients, and they teach classes about how to make your own fermented food. They teach classes in holistic wellness. And it's a zero-waste system where people come back and bring back the mason jar. In our observation, it hasn't impacted their bottom line because people in this culture, there are still people that don't, for whatever, don't have time. You're still gonna, there is still a demand to go and purchase sauerkraut, but they're also broadening the skill set and expertise so that people can make it at home, grow their own cabbage, make their own sauerkraut. So that's kind of what we mean when we say education embedded into your product or service. Which is very related to the next principle is this idea of open source, and enabling people to innovate on whatever you're providing as an intellectual contribution to humanity. And so when thinking about designing your organization, your whole business process can be open sourced. Instead of saying, ah, I can start a very successful business and I can grow by accretion, we look at uh, this other model here of scaling by regional replication. And so instead of having very large organizations, what if I open sourced everything about my business so that it could be regionally replicated where there's the control is decentralized and the the enterprise is adapted to the needs of every specific region. You mentioned zero waste already. It's also true that uh, we help organizations do lots of different things, whether it's from building buildings or making textile materials out of mycelium and so mushrooms and waste wood products uh, that you can actually make. Imagine if everything that you're wearing today uh, was actually beneficial to the climate in terms of the regularity of the carbon cycle, rather than contributing to greenhouse gas emissions and, cl and climate change and the problems that global warming is creating for humanity and all life. Imagine if the needs that you were meeting through your life are actually beneficial to the climate. And it turns out that almost everything, almost everything that we need to do can be produced in that way. And so thinking about that from the get-go as you're designing your organization is a very important consideration. And finally, I'll just mention that uh, when we think about organizations and designing organizations in the next economy, if you're going to check that last box of supporting personal growth and development, imagine conceiving of your organization as a crucible for personal growth and development, or actually elevating the potential of individuals to live into their greatest aspirations. Every organization that we have, every business could be that. It does take a very intentional design to do so. And there are courageous organizations that are doing that. So this is just a set of checklists that, that we, this is a checklist that we use when we're working with organizations to create more wholeness. And if you can imagine an entire economy of every organization following these types of guidelines, it really would be a different world. Uh, our posit is it would be a world that works for everyone with no one left out. 
So I wanted to share a couple of examples, like because I said that the next economy exists in the world, it's just not well distributed. I want to name some examples of actual organizations that we work with or do work with that kind of embody uh, some of these uh, principles. But first, I'm just going to pause and see if any questions are coming in from anybody on life or online. Does this generally make sense as some ideas? Yeah. By show of hands, for the organization, those of you who have started your own company, looking at this list, do you feel that you already do all these things or most of these things? Or all these things? Who might? Who might be the only one? I would go some to most. Some to most. How about some to most? Okay. Yeah, or a few? A few of these things? Yeah, a few of these things, good. Yeah. Is there, are there things that stick out that are missing from these principles? We're not so much that they're going to be missing. Something that's in my mind right now, and maybe when we get to the example from Kira, I'm wondering if that I'm trying to envision it in a way so that it doesn't feel kind of like uh, generally like white affluent people mm -hmm. kind of need this. But um, I guess I'm just wondering how exactly it would work to be more inclusive so that uh, all sorts of leadership can take care of. Yeah. So for the folks on the live stream, we just had a question come up around how do we embody these principles in a way that just doesn't perpetuate white, affluent um, people having access to these types of businesses or goods or services? Um, and uh, I, I, the example that I was going to give um, has actually grappled with, with this a lot. Um, maybe I should go into Sure. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll share just a story from personal, and I'm sure we all have stories of, around how we're addressing this. Um, so this is there. How many people are familiar with Fiber Shed? Uh, me. So going back to this principle of zero waste and climate beneficial, Fiber Shed is an organization. This is California-grown cotton grown in a biodynamic way that is. Um, supporting the regeneration of soil and ecosystem grown intercropped with sheep and producing wool on the same site in Cape May Valley. Um, and we can make our clothes out of this. We can make our clothes in a traceable uh, way that we can actually track um, who, who grew the cotton that then goes into the cloth. Um, here, I'll show it on there. <laughs> um, and, you know, in terms of an, an ideal to aspire for, to, um, when we look at the textile industry as a global industry causing uh, the second largest source of water pollution worldwide after agriculture, um, uh, incredible you know, slave conditions in the making of the garments that are just adding to the accumulation of trash in the landfill, frankly. Um, it's one of the most degrading industries right now on the planet. Um, and in terms of the, we talk about the price parity paradox at Lyft Economy, where so often when you are trying to create a good or service and bring it to market that treats people well and treats the planet well, it's really hard to deliver it to market at a price that is comparable to the multinational extractive prices that we see in, in you know, everyday life. Um, and the within the fiber shed example, there have been efforts to, um, for example, we're working right now with Winona Leduc to create a hemp industry on white earth reservation. Folks are familiar with Winona Leduc. She's an amazing woman who founded a, an organization called Honor the Earth. Um, and there have been studies that show that the, the, if you buy one item of clothing that lasts for 20, 30 years, you're actually spending less than you would going to a big box store where you're inundated by packaging and ads that causes you actually to consume more. Um, I, I'm kind of sharing like a, um, a th thought line rather than an answer for you because I think that this is one of the key questions that I wake up every morning holding. Um, and it, it's one of the reasons why we, we have diverse and um, inclusive ownership at kind of right there second at the core principle because what we've observed is um, when we can effectively catalyze organizations where there is shared ownership that is diverse, so 50% um, women owned, 50% person of color owned, that that um, 
uh, there's a term that our part, business partner Phoenix Soleil uses, which is um, cognitive tension or like this ability to to create more opportunities for dialogue and discussion that can help us collectively solve this conundrum of the price parity paradox. Maybe I can offer another example. Yeah. Uh, and the price parity paradox is a natural conclusion to come to. Like if we're going to be internalizing the costs that the business as usual economy externalizes, it's very difficult to make a world that works for everybody that's equitable. Ownership is one of the pathways through the price parity paradox. An example that I would give of an organization is called Our Table. It's a farm, store, and small commercial kitchen all combined into one. So it's partially vertically integrated, which is another kind of pathway through the price parity paradox. Um, it's a multi-stakeholder cooperative. It's up in Oregon, in Sherwood, Oregon, near Portland. But it's a multi-stakeholder cooperative. It means it's one of less than a dozen farms in this country that are as owned by the farmers. So the farmers, which is a you know, typically a categorically excluded and oppressed and exploited group of people in this country, um, think of the Latino farmers in California, just an example, uh, that those same farmers actually are own, own the company, own the farm. But they're not the only people who own the farm. The farm is also co-owned by a network of regional producers. Uh, so other farmers in the Willamette area are also a part owner. And there's another class of owners, which is actually the consumers, the, the people who purchase the biodynamically grown mixed organic mixed vegetables uh, from, the, the, from the farm. What they do, what's, what's messy is hard, is they, they actually get together literally around one big table and they collectively arrive at decisions like, how much should the food cost, not in general, but how much should the food cost for you? How much for the, should the food cost for you? Based on your needs, based on your background, based on your privilege, how much should the workers be paid? How much should this worker be paid? Uh, and they actually arrive at those decisions collectively, which is really hard work because humanity does not, in general, have a lot of experience making collective decisions with each other. But they voluntarily engage both in a novel ownership structure, a multi-stakeholder structure, and in democratic processes to arrive at equitable distribution so that the food, which people need, a needed good, can be accessible to those who need fresh, organic, healthy food, nutrient-dense food, and while treating the land well and treating the labor well that's producing that food. Now, our table is one farm in Oregon, right? Does that make an entire economy? No, but what if there's, in your mind's eye, what if there were 250,000 our table type farms across this country? Imagine if everybody, if you were a owner in a farm, you might live in the city here, some of you might live in an apartment or share, share a bedroom in an apartment, and imagine if you got your food from the local multi-stakeholder cooperative vertically integrated farm. Those might not be the words you use, but it's a farm that captures all of its waste and upcycles it in a small scale commercial kitchen so that there's no food waste and no greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. They have a convenient micro marketplace where people go and actually celebrate culturally, have art events and make music and, and talk to each other and commune and play games. And at that marketplace, they actually can provide produce not only from that farm, but from the other regional producers who share in the ownership of the farm. There's one hour table today, but there could be hundreds of thousands. One of the things that needs to change for that to happen is how organizations get capitalized. Um, because the our table is also indicative of a number of the next economy organizations that we work with and help design and that one of the pitfalls of entrepreneurs that we meet who want to grow an organization in alignment with their values in the next economy, say, I need resources, I need money to start my company. Um, and the business as usual economy says, great, you need money, we've got some answers for you. As long as you're white uh, and a male, but we've got answers for you. 
And their answers uh, of how business as usual economy has capital uh, typically require an organization to use design principles that are essentially antithetical to the outcomes that the next economy promises. And that is very problematic. One of the reasons that Lyft Economy, we started something called the Force for Good Fund, which is a new type of investment fund that is actually also invested in by the public, the public fund, uh, crowdfunded, if you will, so that we can change the notions of return and risk and the norms of business as usual capital to transform how organizations can be capitalized. This is all kind of early stages stuff, but if you want to make a pathway to that world that works for everybody, we need to innovate on those things. And Lyft Economy is not alone. There's newer ways of capitalizing organizations, and we teach entrepreneurs how to access the different forms of capital. We work with entrepreneurs about how to incorporate new structures so that they can be more inclusive we, and more, make their goods and services more accessible. And we work with entrepreneurs to actually figure out how to regionally replicate, blueprint, open source what they're doing that's working so that it can be done a thousand times over. That's some of the, the stuff that we, we do to try and help make the next economy more real. I'm gonna pause. Sean, Andrew. Yeah, there's. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, one distinction from, um, from the chat, uh, Delilah asked a question of, um, you know, do we have uh, examples of this, uh, this system of principles being successful and or unsuccessful? And one thing I wanted to say just in, in response to that is that, um, Mostly this list of principles is from our observations, uh, from us being you know, involved in, in this movement for the last 20 years and watching and seeing the patterns. Uh, and as opposed to, um, there's very few organizations that are actually working off this particular checklist in order to start up. We do have some that are our clients and our, our MBA students, um, but they're probably in the one to 200 range rather than the that hundreds of thousands of small businesses um, you know, that are starting up. So uh, we, we would love to see this uh, checklist used more widely uh, and referenced when people are starting up. But at this point, it's mostly us observing the patterns uh, and, and putting this list together. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of frame uh, the answer that way. And, uh, and hopefully the, the, some of the examples we're sharing are uh, informative of that. And I, I guess I regret to inform, we might not have uh, examples ready to share of these uh, principles being failures, um, but maybe we could think of some. <laughs> well, and, and to, that, to that point, John, we could definitely highlight organizations that exist that have taken pieces of this checklist and that are successful, both these specific organizations, say Organic Valley, a large producer cooperative, now over a billion dollars, um, it's a significant size, and in terms of the impact it has on uh, uh, the dairy industry uh, in this country, in terms of what's happening to the land and what outcomes are happening for farmers, it's categorically different than the business as usual economy because of the, the structure. The actual business structure is distinct. Um, well, there's another, um, there's another question in chat that I think is really relevant that we actually wanted to call in as well, which is um, Delilah brought up um, involving foundations in this process of, of uh, changing the norms of how capital gets redistributed. Um, and you know, we, we work as well as in the impact investing world, we also work with um, foundations that are looking at, instead of just giving grants, they're looking at making program related investments. Um, and so actually, we, we also see that as an opportunity for foundations to, you know, change the nature of the extractive philanthropic industry right now, which is, you know, the corpus, the largest mass of a, of a philanthropy's money is actually invested in things like fossil fuels and coal, um, and how we can actually catalyze the conversion of that into impact investing, um, which does, you know, provide a, a return, different, a whole range and gamut of returns. Um, but in ways that actually is supporting this next economy as well. So I wanted to just call that out. That was a great, um, great comment. Um, Karen brought up Tides, RSF, um, and San Francisco Foundation. Um, 
and maybe this would also be a good uh, time to mention the distinction between nonprofit and for profit. Sure. Uh, a lot of people come working with um, the economy and thinking about the next economy um, and starting their organization have questions about legal incorporation structure. One thing that I think surprises a lot of entrepreneurs is we make a big distinction between legal form, legal structure, and operating structure. So whereas legal structure, there's uh, benefit corporation in at least 30 some states, 34 states, there's uh, you can incorporate as some type of benefit corporation or there's LLC, sole proprietorship, partnership, what I mentioned multi-stakeholder cooperative, there's C corporation, uh, there's for public benefit corporation or a 501c3, a non-profit or 501c other forms of non-profit. So there's legal structures which have certain covenants and agreements and then there's operating structures in terms of roles and accountabilities, power dynamics, and how an organization operates. And those two things are distinct. What, uh, and I think it surprises people. Some people come to the idea of the next economy and they think about the legal structure as being imperative. Um, I'm starting a nonprofit because I want to do good in the world. And just in terms of our learning over the years, you know, we've kind of looked at those questions and we've come to dissociate the idea of nonprofit equals good. Uh, you know, the NRA is a nonprofit. Some of you might think it's good, some of you might not think it's good. The NFL, the football stuff, uh, was a nonprofit until a few years ago for decades. You know, I don't know. Nonprofit doesn't necessarily for us equate to good versus bad. Trump has a lot of his charitable foundation, lots of nonprofits. So again, however you said politically or whatever, nonprofit doesn't necessarily equate with good. Nonprofit means that the IRS essentially has said, or some state or the federal government has said, you have a charitable purpose that we can agree with, whether it's for education, whatever you told them, they've given you the sign off. Now your charity, your charitable purpose may not necessarily be serving a vision of the next economy. That said, nonprofit can be a very viable um, uh, opportunity to pursue creating goods and services that people need, creating this next economy, uh, especially if the reciprocity for what you're doing uh, needs to come from sources that can benefit from some type of charitable gift or donation or tax exemption. If that's self-evident, a nonprofit might be a great way to do it. And Again, nonprofit doesn't mean that you don't provide goods or service. Many, many nonprofits make earned income as part of the way in which they sustain themselves. So Brian is asking us to share, um, what advice would you give to somebody who's looking to start a next economy enterprise? So who wants to get involved in the next yeah. economy enterprise. Because we get uh, this question a lot. I feel like Kevin is what? You know, I'm, I'm interested, I believe in it, so what do I do? Like, what's the, act, what's the steps or next actions you would recommend? Well, in, the, in a lot of the training that we do when we work with individuals, either in groups or one-on-one, -on -one, we talk about life design, proceeding, kind of uh, organizational design. And in life design, finding your kind of vocational pathway, the things that you're, where your skills and experience are or where you want them to go, and what your passions are, and look at the whole constellation of factors of your life. Uh, what are the constraints based on past decisions or past experiences, or just how you were raised or where you are, and the opportunities, and actually intentionally setting directionals, not destinations, but setting directionals in terms of your life design, uh, and in that uh, ex exploration of your skills, experiences, and background, and aspirations, there are a number of steps that might involve getting involved with particular organizations, either as a first, maybe even as a consumer or supporter, or maybe as an investor, or maybe as a worker or owner, uh, maybe as an employee, and then maybe as something that you start yourself. So volunteer. as a volunteer. And so starting with life design first is the key. And then if you already have your life design figured out, like, I want to get involved in something that does, I, I got it, I, I, I've, I've done banking all my life. Where are the, the opportunities to work with, uh, with banks? A great reference point would be we have a whole community of people involved in the, our next economy trainings. 
where we can just actually just crowdsource ideas of credit unions and uh, some of, there's a handful of banks that are already certified B Corps. Uh, certified B Corps, there's about you know over 2,000 uh, in the world, maybe 2,500 or so in the world. Are they the paragon of every of checking off all the boxes on the next economy checklist? Not even close. Um, but are they generally operating from a, a distinct premise from the business as usual economy? The distinct premise being that we should consider people and the planet in addition to profits or wealth accumulation. Uh, they are they are taking a stand for that, and so that's one way to navigate from the business as usual economy with your skills, experience, and vocational aspirations in something that's definitely better or less bad, moving towards something that's optimal and designing your own. Brian, do you want to add to that now that you're on? Uh, I I think that's. You know, I guess like what I'm thinking is probably like two perspectives that are most prevalent are like starting a next economy enterprise. And then like I'm an employee of, of, and it's maybe I don't want to start a business, but I want to work for one. Um, so like, have you already talked about, um, you know, the, the, like if I'm going to start a business, is there any sort of particular like top, top actions you would take to like set the, the stage for you know, making sure your company is aligned with those values. That's just where we're, it's a great segue to some of the things we we're going to talk about next. So nice. <laughs> those of you who are uh, starting an organization, uh, the one thing that uh, I would recommend is how clear is your vision in relation to some of the principles on that checklist? Uh, do you have an explicit vision, a set of goals and an orientation uh, that incorporates those ideas, maybe not all of them, but uh, many of them, and starting with starting with vision. Uh, and it's a, something that gets skipped over, like there's an implicit sense that I know where I'm going. We, our critical success factor is actually to draw that out and make it explicit. And we have some templates that we can share with you to help you do that. Uh, then another question that we would have uh, to, to take next steps would be make sure that you're the thing that you want to provide is actually a known need. Uh, what happens, one of the, I mentioned it earlier, alluded to it, one of the small tragedies of next economy entrepreneurs is they see a world of hurt and a world of needs and there's, they want to provide this need, it's something that's obviously needed, but the question you can ask yourself, is it a known need? Uh, do people know that they need this alternative or this other way of meeting uh, what they, that you see that they need. And in many cases, your vision and your aspiration might be ahead of the market. And so, uh, meaning that there might not be people who are seeing that as their no need. When that's the case, there's a, a set of design pivots and exercises that we would advocate for that are really important. So confirm that what you have and your idea is actually needed. And so, from there, how do you do that? Well, we have a number of exercises that we train people to go through that are related to, you know, at large, you could say the there's something from the business as usual economy that's emerged over the last 20 years, which is really valuable. This idea of lean, being really lean, trying things on and getting feedback. Uh, so actually, we train people on how to try ideas out there, gather information and feedback, and then based on that feedback, make changes and adjustments and get, go get more feedback as inexpensively and as quickly as possible. And that's it. So for those of you who are starting an organization, actually validating that there is a no need for what you want to provide is really important. And then if you find that you need resources, I need capital, I need something, uh, there's the third critical success factor, vision, is there a market? And the next step is if you need resources, is to make sure that you know what the alternatives are because the business as usual sources of capital, almost without exception, will force compromises in your values according to that checklist that we, we talked about. The structures of business as usual capital, the capital stack is not oriented to support actually prioritizing benefiting humans and benefiting the planet at the same time. So just, so if you, if you find you need resources, Make sure that you're aware of the alternatives. Ryan, Sean, and Andrew, Aaron, you want to add anything to those ideas? Um, 
maybe just to, to recapitulate. So Kevin mentioned three things pretty quickly. So the first step would be really getting clarity on your vision. The second step would be, um, is your vision, your good or service meeting a known need? So there, you already have evidence of the demand in the market. You've done market research and we have a bunch of tools that we take entrepreneurs through. And then, um, and then when seeking out resources, uh, making sure that you um, you know all the options of crowdfunding or um, investment that will not uh, necessitate you compromising your, your values to, to deliver that good or service. And one of our, our partners that we work with is Jenny Casson, who helped, she created the Force for Good Fund and the structure. She's an attorney and uh, she supports women and people of color to raise capital in ways that's non-extractive. Non any questions coming up or thoughts or, or someone want to be bold enough to put one of their uh, goods or services up as, as an example or, yeah. I just, um, something to think about maybe to have an 11 design principle mm -hmm. would be that the organization or entity um, creates and owns the brain and narrative mm -hmm. for, its, for the organization. And to the extent that predatory capitalism, all of this, you know, dominant paradigm always want to own the brain and narrative that often debilitates opportunity and actually. Can I repeat sure. that for the yeah, for those of you who couldn't hear, uh, we, we heard the idea of uh, of design principle for next economy is to own kind of the frame and narrative. Uh, which is something that uh, the business as usual economy typically does in an exploitative sense, right? Yeah. I, I was going to mention a really poignant example of that that relates to Angeline's earlier question, which is um, the sharing economy, right? How do we actually reclaim the sharing economy? Because it is a critical uh, piece to make it affordable, to make it accessible for us all to have access to resources by sharing them. Um, but there, it has been uh, reframed and uh, claimed and co-opted by, by business as usual. So, so really making sure that we, we have those, dis that we as consumers have that discernment, discernment too. So when we're walking in the world, we're noticing, okay, this is, this is a sharing economy that I can support. And this is a sharing economy that might be perpetuating power and privilege in, in a certain regard. Great. Any other questions coming up on life or online? Yeah. So um, in, in March, I took the plunge and uh, quit my steady job to start a B Corp. Yeah. And um, I think our, you know, some things we've got together, our, our vision is to provide um, uh, assisted products for people with disabilities globally. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a billion dollar growing market. Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of co-founders. Yep. Uh, we, we check a lot of the boxes, including um, being able to make product locally. Yeah. Um, so I think that there's a lot of things that we have together, but you know, even after going through an accelerator and yep. talking to Jenny and looking at a lot of crowdfunding options, yeah, it's it's really hard to make that 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 pioneer, you know, jump over the pioneer gap. Yeah. There's a lot of funds that want to support you after you have a million dollars of revenue. Yeah. Um, but getting to that point is really a challenge. Yeah, I would just be curious to hear as far as what you all are doing uh, for for B Corp. Like, how are you helping you know seed stage or even pre seed stage organizations really you know, really launch? Yeah, great. So when it's a really common. So the the question for those of you who are online is that there is a, an emergent B Corp providing a very needed good set of goods and services uh, with a no need. Uh, global demand and looking at accessing resources, whereas even the impact investment marketplace that is theoretically positioned as uh, distinct from the business as usual capital stack is requiring a much later stage, a de-risked profile of at least a million dollars in annual revenue before financing might be available. How do we cross that hurdle to get to that stage? when we're at an earlier stage. And, you know, there are, um, 
a, there's a diversity of approaches that we look at when we talk about accessing resources, which is most common. And I'll quickly go through them, but just to note that we have a much larger training on making sure that we've kind of checked off the, the, the steps. The order of operations, and you know, I'll mention them for everybody's benefit, and I'll assume you've gone through these first couple. Uh, the first or step is, you know, is there a way to uh, bootstrap goods um, and incorporate your your customers as owners, uh, so that they can, in, in advance of them receiving the goods that they need, actually invest uh, as owners. Um, so look look to your customers for ownership. And that could be either formal ownership or informal ownership. Uh, so the, the, the cliche would be bootstrap by growing off of revenues. And uh, that could be either pre-selling products or if you have a certain set of products that already you can reliably create that have a certain amount of profit margin, can you expand your customer base just and grow off of profits? And once you have enough uh, to invest in yourself, expand. That's one thing, again. N noting that many entrepreneurs think about that, try that on, reach their limits uh, about what's possible there, and that's a natural growth to actually reach that limit and not be able to use that as a growing strategy. Second one is to look to partners. Partners that uh, uh, stand to benefit from the vision that you're holding of what growth you want to have. Uh, so if there are partners, those could be suppliers, in, certain, in the case of goods companies that have certain supplies, that they will generate more sales and transactions of their goods if you, into the future, achieve your visions, uh, or it could be distributors. Depends on the good or service, but in general, look to the network of partners to stand to benefit from your imminent growth and look to them for capitalization. Now, that the form of capitalization might be extensions on terms. So sometimes when we look at that strategy, it's not that they have the cash capacity to do corporate venturing to actually invest in cash, in your organization, sometimes they say, here, you can have all these supplies, you don't have to pay us for a year or two years or something like that. And so again, many entrepreneurs check that box as well and have explored that to, to the end. Uh, many entrepreneurs we meet skip over those two. Um, so it's, it's, both, both things can be true. Hey, Kevin. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, just a, a, a couple of things. Um, time check, we're, we're getting close to the end. There's, uh, Angela has a question if you can talk about the MBA program and then I also have a request if you could unshare your screen on the, the, the principles checklist. And Sean, thanks for bringing that up. We are going to, we'll go five minutes or so after the hour. It's two right now because we started a few minutes late. So if everyone's okay with that and obviously if you need to leave, I uh, we'll want to honor your time here and, and just thank you for, for showing up and sharing your time with us. This is really meaningful for us to see the amount of interest and in people really craving getting involved and ways to get involved. So should we talk about the MBA? Sure. Uh, yeah. So we can go after the, the, the next three steps in terms of capitalization. There's three other stages to look at. What's your question? Okay. Yes. I can, and I can talk to you both separately as well. Yeah, we'll yeah. stick around here yeah. after. Yeah. To make sure you have that. Uh, who wants to share about the uh, MBA? Or John or Andrew? The MBA training is uh, uh, something that we started last year, uh, and it's a nine-month uh, program. It's an alternative. It's about as accredited as Trump University. It's not an accredited uh, MBA program. Uh, it's a, but it's uh, meant to. We work with so many entrepreneurs who went and had their MBA. Some from the Green MBA School. Some from Wharton or Harvard or whatever, and we work with these entrepreneurs and say, oh, the things that you are that you share in your training are just categorically distinct from anything I learned in my MBA. And so uh, the stuff that we cover in nine months uh, is essentially this. For the first you know, session is like, what is the next economy? Ways to think about it, the, the language and the shared understanding. And then we go into, okay, how do I move to get into an organization uh, that is in the next economy or start or grow an organization in the next economy? And that the, the first uh, session is about three months of the content or so, and the, six, the following six months are how to grow an organization. And it goes pretty deep on certain things like uh, how to access resources and capitalize an organization, how to structure, what are my structuring options, uh, both 
legal structure and operational structure, uh, learning the distinctions between uh, governance and ownership. Those two things are also distinct and very important to understand. Uh, learning how to develop, do market development, so get additional customers, how to set hypotheses, try things on, how to collect feedback. And there's a whole kind of layer of a system that we've developed after working with over 150 organizations over the last 10 years as Lyft Economy. We have a set of systems, an organizational design, we call it, where there's certain org areas, roles, and responsibilities. It's a pattern literacy for organizational development that applies to whether you're a co-op or a 501c3 or a charitable foundation, and all, whatever, or an LLC or a benefit corporation, whatever organization you have, the, the, the pattern is the same. And uh, we, we, help, we have systems attached to each aspect of the pattern, and we basically train you on those systems. Um, and that's what the nine months is. And there's some very specific deep dives, like communication skills and that kind of thing. Yeah, I just, I wanted to build on that. Um, one of our business partners, Phoenix Soleil, has experience in nonviolent communication. So we do training on that, which we feel is very important. Um, the other thing that I, I would add to what Kevin shared is, is the, the cohort um, feeling. And, and that one thing that we are really trying to cultivate through our MBA program is, um, your connectivity to the last cohort, um, as well as the connect connectivity within the cohort. So we saw a lot of um, uh, kind of shared accountability, helping people propel themselves past, you know, ingrained fears or um, self-questioning, um, and that that can be really powerful in this world where you walk down the street and everything is indicating for you to stop trying to, you know, do do something that really creates outside value in return for people and planet. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, we also, we, we see the next economy as one that works for all people. Um, and so we, we recognize that based on our observations of structural racism and systemic in inequity, um, we know there's no perfect way to offer um, kind of more accessible, but we do offer a person of color discount. So if you know people that are interested, um, talk to us about that as well. Um, and uh, we're really aspiring to be, to model that principle of diversity and inclusion in, in the cohort. Um, so we love your input and support and strategy around how we can reach out more in that way. Hey, uh, Aaron and Kevin, oh, there's just oh, there's a good question coming from Angela on the chat. She says, I know you've run it the course one time. She's curious um, what we learned from the first one and what we're changing this time around. And then also if it uh, will be applicable for her, she's run a business in the past but doesn't currently have one. Great. I can say two things and maybe Sean, if you want to add. Uh, uh, two, two things that I would say it would include, uh, we did learn a lot. Uh, some of the things we learned specifically are to share more from our direct experiences, stories from the field. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, kind of systems and templates, which are great. So we have extra fun or homework assignments that you can use throughout the nine months in either developing your or growing your existing organization and uh, in the actual session time when we're together, uh, we now have lined up case studies for pretty much every session so that we can actually go through more case studies. That's one key learning. Uh, we've also learned uh, that the, some reordering of things, the communication skills training work, uh, we think uh, can go a little bit earlier in the, in the training and be emphasized a little bit more uh, as being a critical success factor for growing or starting an organization as two examples. Uh, you've already started a business. Will you get enough value out of it? I can't tell you we, we, if, if, if you will or not. Uh, we did uh, start this because people asked us how to, from our, our, our clients and other people, there were people who were asking us to do this, to try this on, and to make it more accessible to people who don't live in the Bay Area or near Sean in New York. Can we create something that anybody can access? And that was uh, our response. We do make it so that if you sign up and take the training and it's something that didn't meet your needs, 
Um, as long as you have a conversation with us and share with us why it wasn't valuable for you, uh, you can get 100% refund. We're not we're not trying to. Uh, um, our, we value both accessibility and transparency, and our goal is to create the next economy together uh, in collaboration with others. So if somebody says, I didn't get anything out of that, uh, that's totally acceptable, and we can have a conversation about it. So there's no risk uh, if somebody wants to sign up and you can get your any uh, reciprocity provided can get back to you if need be. It's also iterative, Kevin, in a way, like, uh, so 25 people max. So um it's also whoever's in the course we sort of custom design it we get feedback each session so it's like it's not like it's set in stone um so yeah I'll pick that up. Uh, and the other thing we we added um we started last time not right away but uh a little bit in we started with a a, a separate hour-long q a office hour session after each um section and that was quite popular so we'll definitely continue that and just my other comment is Kevin shared some of the details, but in, in essence, we got uh, great engagement and feedback from the first time around. And so this second time around is going to be a little more robust. We're going to be going basically uh, going deeper into each uh, category and adding, like Kevin's saying, case studies, examples, uh, more resources. Uh, so uh, basically the first time around was gave us abundant um, information that this was really valuable and that people wanted it. And so we're kind of doubling down and, and, and putting more and more effort into it. Great, thanks Sean. Does anybody have any other questions on, on life or online? There's only so much we can share in an hour. Uh, I did uh, mention a couple of uh, templates. Um, I'm very happy if you, if you did sign up on the Eventbrite, we can send out the checklist uh, that was shared. We have a template that has a lot of detail in it, uh, which may require, it's one of the core templates we use in the training. We'll send that out as well. Uh, it's you know totally open source and free for you to use and, and to add to it, uh, though, some of the sections might not make perfect sense to you because we didn't have time to talk about them, um, but uh, I'll, I'll send that out. Uh, and uh, yeah, is there any other questions or comments that came in? Um, feel free to reach out to any of the LIFT partners with additional questions. Um, we're all, all of our emails are just our first name at lifteconomy.com and Sean offered his email as well if you have questions around the NBA. Um, and I guess with that, we will close the um, formal uh, program part of this, and then we'll uh, we'll stick here to answer questions of the folks that are still in the room. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming.